Hello, everybody. Welcome to part eight of the Magdalene Manuscript. I know it's been a couple of weeks since we picked up our homework, our book, the Magdalene Manuscript. I thank you guys so much for being super, super patient as I last minute started to travel with Stephanie, even though it was last minute. It was totally, totally divine. Now, this is airing on Tuesday, July 12th. I am recording this, however, on Wednesday, July 6th at 7.02 a.m. I did get back from D.C. yesterday, and I don't know if you guys noticed, my voice is a little bit hoarse. Um, we filmed a lot. We have a lot of footage to go through. The places we've been so far are obviously D.C. We went to the Isis Temple in Tennessee. We went to the Georgia Guidestones, and of course, we did a lot in Atlanta and in Rome, Georgia. Now, again, I'm not sure when all that footage will air. I am going to start working on some of that footage this evening, uh, Tuesday, July 6th. So maybe by the time you're watching this, you've already seen some of the footage. This is not the last of our travels together. In fact, we have way more locations in the works. And I'm just going to put this out here to see uh, what you guys think. I am going to leave the comments up for this particular video so I can see your feedback. Again, any abusive comments or bullying behavior will be blocked on this channel. But um, we are going to be heading up at some point to Salem, Massachusetts. I do have some dates in mind. However, if you're following me along on Twitter, as I said yesterday, when I am in a particular location with Stephanie, I will be dropping footage in real time over on my Twitter account and sometimes on Instagram, depending on how much time I have in the moment to load stuff. But my Twitter account gets way more action than my Instagram account. That's why I'm putting most of that over there. However, on the times or uh, the days that I actually travel, I'm not going to be putting those dates out because I do know that I have a lot of people watching who are here for my highest good and Stephanie's highest good, but I also uh, at the same time have a lot of people watching who are not here for my highest good. And some of these people watching are very, very dangerous and they do know how to do black magic. So um, the dates of my travel will not be mentioned, but with that being said, when we're in Salem, we are considering doing a live event. Um, we're not, we don't know yet if it's going to be like a meet and greet or if we're going to film a live show in Salem. And um, if we can get enough people who can travel to Salem, Massachusetts to join us for this show, we will do a live show with the live studio audience. If that's something you guys are interested in, we just have to figure out how many people would be able to make that journey into Salem. As I said on my Twitter yesterday, most of our traveling we're doing right now is actually all of our traveling we're doing right now is by car because I am distrustful of pilots who, you know, so until that's all rectified, I probably will not be flying for a while. I'm I'm a huge traveler. I have always been a huge traveler. I've spent most of my life going back and forth to different countries, but at this in this moment, because of, I'm just a little bit paranoid about getting on a plane, but driving is fine. Um, I don't mind driving. I've driven long road trips across the country many times. So that that's totally fine. But if you're close to Salem, or if you would be interested in making the journey to Salem, Massachusetts for a live show for a meet and greet, whatever the case may be, please let me know down in the comment section below, just so we have an idea. We might have to charge a ticket price, very cheap, like $10, just so we can cover possible security. Um, Cause we might have to have a, a bit of a security system just to make sure that nobody nefarious is entering into the facility. Um, also in case we want to offer like snacks or something for you guys, there might have to, that's all it would be would just be to cover something like that. It, it would really literally just be to cover that. So just let me know down in the comment section below if that's something that you are interested in. All right. So today we're starting with um, page 136 in my book, which is, again, this is part eight, which is a brief comparative of internal alchemies. This is probably going to be part eight A um, because again, like the last chapter, there's a lot of different sections. And in order to make these podcasts, these videos, these episodes, a reasonable length, we're going to have to divide it up. And I also think it's good to give you time, just like with the Sophia code, to give the viewer, myself included, time to kind of integrate everything that's being spoken about in this book. As I've said before, 
The back part of this book, where the guy who wrote the book is actually talking about alchemy, is way more fascinating to me than the front part of the book. Again, if you're new to this channel, I would suggest that you start with part one first, because the first part of the book is him channeling the person that we know as Mary Magdalene. Now, I know that she wants to just be called Magdalene or Maggie. Um, I've been told and I found in my research that the name Mary was kind of like a Jane Doe type name that the powers that be gave a lot of these women just to kind of, I don't know, dehumanize them a little bit. So Magdalene was actually her name. I know Stephanie has found information that says that Mother Mary's name was possibly Alma Mari, which makes sense to me. I think it's a beautiful name. They all had beautiful names. And, um, but the first part, as I said before, there's a lot of confirmation bias because when this book was written, I believe it was written and channeled in the early 2000s. And as of a year ago, I would have believed everything about the crucifixion, all that kind of stuff, because we were so programmed. We've all been so, so highly programmed to believe that the person known as Jesus, Yahshua, she actually calls him Yahshua in this, which was his real name. Yahshua was crucified. Well, now I'm starting to see information and my gut instinct is telling me he was never crucified. The crucifixion story goes with the Mithra story. And that's what the controllers want us to start worshiping is the Luciferian human sacrifices and the cannibalism such as communion. And so he, he does, though, talk about uh, Yahshua's crucifixion. I think that's just confirmation by bias, though, because that is what we have been taught over and over and over and over again. Um, but everything else in the uh, channeled section does confirm a lot of my research with the uh, priests and priestesshood of Isis, where Magdalene and Yahshua were not of Jewish descent. They were of Egyptian descent, meaning that they practiced um and their spiritual life and their religious life was in the priest and priestess of isis and she speaks a lot about this and so now he's getting into the alchemy of what all this stuff means which does mirror a lot of what i've studied in in india through yoga i know in this section he's going to get into tantric yoga there are typically two two um paths of yoga there's a, there's the patanjali path and the tantric path my actual practice is the patanjali path um, but as far as the tantric information, it's all coming from the same source, which comes from the Yoga Karanta. It comes from the Yoga Sutras, uh, all the Vedic texts, the Upanishads, all these old texts. It's all coming from the same source. So I am fully aware of all the different channels of energy in the body, because even in the Patanjali system, we do work with the energies within our body as far as the chakra systems, the two different nostrils, Shashumna. We just do it more with ourselves versus in the tantric system, it's doing it with a partner. Both are valuable. Both are equally valuable, basically. It just depends on your, your preference in which one you practice. And I am getting more into the tantric stuff myself within my own, my own practice. Um, however, it's easy for me to slide into the tantric no pun intended, thinking of like sex magic slide into, um, slide into the tantric system because I'm highly educated in the Patanjali system, which again, uses the chakra system as well, uses the Bunda system, uses all of these values, these pathways of energetic channels within the body, if that makes sense. So for me, that's super easy just to understand what he's saying and to kind of slide into that system as well. But if this is something you're super interested in, if you don't have this book, I would suggest getting it. I would also suggest finding a teacher. It is very important that you find a teacher. If you don't have a teacher, if you don't have someone to guide you through this, then the chances of it going awry, going bad are very high, right? It's because we have the ego. And so part of a, a part of the yoga practice too, is to kind of understand what the ego is and to understand that the ego is what is fearful. The ego is what has pride. The ego is what puts up obstacles for you. The reason that is, is because the ego is what is mortal. Your soul is not mortal. Your soul has no pride. Your soul is nothing but love. It's nothing but continual, unconditional love. The ego though, is what has fear. Because when the day comes that your body passes away, the ego, the ego goes with the body. The soul doesn't, the soul lives on. So but sometimes this ego can be, can be a bit of a trickster. And so it's really important that you have a teacher there to kind of help you with your blind spots, challenge you where you need to be challenged. Your teacher should not be somebody that coddles you or that is sweet to you. They, I mean, they need to be nice to you, but you know, not abusive, but they need to be very stern with you. And so I would suggest that you find yourself a teacher if this is something that you're interested in, just to help you maintain your... Um, it maintain integrity within your path, if that makes sense. All right, so let's get started. 
So again, this is page 136, a brief comparative of internal alchemy. So this is a personal note from Tom, the guy who wrote this book. A primary task of Egyptian alchemy was taught by the Magdalene is to strengthen the Ka body, so like the energetic spiritual body. This is done through states of high ecstasy, since ecstasy and bliss strengthen the Ka. There are two primary paths that can be taken in this regard. For those in a sacred relationship exploring the sex magic of Isis, the ecstasy naturally arises during lovemaking. But for those engaged in the solitary path, the alchemies of Horus, the ac ecstasy is self-generated. And he did say a sacred relationship, and I want to hit on that too. Because there is, in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, we have what we call the Yamas and the Niyamas. The Yamas are like Ahems and nonviolence. It's very much kind of how you behave in, 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 to the world. Uh, but the the niyama is of more of an internal decision making for yourself, and there is something in the you know, in the niyama is called brahmacharya. Now, back in the day, back when um, yogis uh, lived more like monks, this basically meant celibacy. Now, for us who are what are considered householders, so I am not somebody who's celibate. Well, not somebody who's celibate. So basically, and you watching probably aren't celibate either. So basically what that means is a householder, someone who is not a monk, who is not Brahmin, is that you have to now take that idea of brahmacharya, brahmacharya, which was celibacy, and just basically now evolve it into meaning appropriate use of energy. So what this means, as I said, tell my student, is like, don't be a slut. You know, basically... Now, with that being said, I'm very, 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 very anti-purity culture. I think purity cult culture is extremely toxic, but there needs to be some gray. Like you have to kind of land somewhere in the middle. And so, you know, you do you, but you, you need to understand that every time you engage in intimacy with another human being, you are in that regard sharing karma with that person, especially if you are a woman, you are taking in, literally taking in the essence of another person. And this can cause all sorts of issues. Now, if you are in a sacred relationship, as he says, where there is love and there is trust, then this can be a beautiful, beautiful exchange of energy. It can be amazing. But if you're just you know, running from person to person to person to person, you're creating like a shit storm for yourself of different energies. And that's something that every single person needs to understand. And you are in control of that. You know, you, you decide who you give yourself to. And so I would just really make sure you understand that. And I'm, I'm, I like that he called it a sacred relationship. And as we saw with the beginning part of this book with uh, Magdalene's channeling, she talked about that the woman especially needs to have trust needs to be completely in a, in a pure state of trust in that moment with the man that she is with, because otherwise it's not going to work uh, if she's holding back. And, and I've been very honest. That's something that I'm having to work on is being able to kind of let myself go because I have been hurt in the past. And so that is something that, that I, I'm working on with myself, not with another person, but just with myself trying to get to the root of that. So when that arises, I will be able to, to let go completely and be in that state of trust. So I wanted to just bring that up again, super, super, super important. All right. For those on both the solidary and duic path, I believe the section will prove invaluable by placing the manuscript within the context of the other alchemical systems. I also feel that those working with other systems of internal alchemy may find the information below helpful in placing their own practices in relation to the manuscript. All right, so that's his own personal note. Now we're going to get into the actual information. This section explores comparisons between three of the four major alchemical systems, Tantric Yoga, Taoism, and Tibetan Buddhist Tantra. Egyptian alchemy was presented in the previous chapter, and the reader will undoubtedly recognize some common elements between the Egyptian system and those of other three lineages discussed in this section. Those already familiar with these systems of alchemy have, no doubt, recognized the unusual position taken by the manuscript in regards to the sex act. As a student of comparative alchemies and mystical traditions, this was one of the first things that struck me about Magdalene's material. And that is correct. If you guys remember when we went through the first system of Egyptian alchemy, I was comparing it left, right, and center to the practice of yoga. It's all the same thing. It might be called different things, but it's all the same stuff. If I may summarize these differences, I would say that the system introduced by the Magdalene is architecturally female-based. According to the Magdalene, the female holds within her nature the secrets of creation. 
Magdalene goes on to mention how she was trained in the alchemies of Horus and how to raise the serpents through the meditative powers. But in the presence of Yahshua, and especially during their lovemaking, the alchemies naturally presented themselves. In other words, they engaged without her having to, having to do anything. She speaks at great length about how the female must feel safe and appreciated in a relationship with her beloved, as I just said, 100%. Then and only then can the alchemies of transformation she calls the sex magic of Isis occur. If these elements, safety and appreciation, are in place within the relationship, the female can let go and allow the fem feminine mysteries to express themselves through her. When this occurs during lovemaking, there is often a shuddering in the female. If she allows this shaking to proceed, it will take her deeper into these mysteries. If the male has trained himself to nest within the vibrational energies released by his partner, then both he and his beloved can strengthen their ka bodies, one of the primary goals of this system. The central place of the female in this alchemical system is strikingly different from any other alchemical systems. In many regards, the main alchemical system of the world are male-based. For instance, in Taoist literature, there are fewer written instructions for females than for males. Even though Taoism is considered by some to be matrilineal linear in practice, at least in the last few hundred years, most of the emphasis was upon the male practitioners. There were no doubt very developed female sages in China, but their presence is not generally represented in Taoist alchemy's treaties, with some notable exceptions. In fact, some Taoists practicing dual cultivation, the sex practices of Taoism, in previous centuries viewed women as mere containers of qi. These unscrupulous practitioners were engaged in the act solely for the purpose of extracting the female's excess qi with little regard for her comfort and safety. And this is why I think a lot of women like myself have trust issues. <laughs> In Tibetan Buddhism, although the feminine principle is deeply honored, in practice, women are often re re regulated to lesser places of power and importance. One of the great bodhisattvas of Tibetan Buddhism is Tara, a woman who historically lived in a general area of Tibet. We've talked about Tara in the Sophia Code, the Green Tara, right? When she attained illumination, legend has it that a group of lamas set out to find a new light, noting that an enlightened being had entered the world. Upon tracking the light to her village, they were dismayed to discover that she was a woman. They reputedly said to her, now that you have attained illumination, you can re re be reborn as a man, to which she replied, I will remain forever in the form of a female. To this day, she re resides as a feminine presence in the subtle realm of being the Tibetans call Samboyaya, the realm of pure light and sound. She is known as the swift protectorate and is a power and benevolent being. Yet the attitude of inherent male superiority shows up again and again in not only certain aspects of Tibetan Buddhism, but through much of Buddhism in general. A cursory look at the history of Christianity reveals patriarchal attempts at the disenfranchisement of women within the church and within its historical documents. In the Dark Ages, the church formulated the Nicene Council in an attempt to edit the numerous gospels and sacred writings of the early church under the orders of the Roman ruler Constantine, the council was charged with choosing which of the many scriptures would become part of the New Testament. The result was that the council threw out many of the sacred texts of the time, choosing only those that furthered their own ends. Exactly. That's what we've been doing on this channel. We've been reading what we have available of the missing gospels, the banned gospels, because Constantine was a psychopath. He was definitely a Satanist. For sure. There's evidence to support that. And um, not only did they pick certain gospels to be in the canonized library but they also changed the story and edited it and my opinion is a lot of the gospels that he threw out it was just too much to edit and so they picked the ones that were really easy to edit all right the early mystical vision of the christians had been shaped into a territorial and political desire of the church and state exactly exactly and in the process many of the writing honoring the female were declared a heresy and the Holy Church of Rome began its long campaign to disempower women. During the Middle Ages and especially during the Holy Inquisition, the church routinely burned women suspected of being witches. Often these women were just herbalists and healers. Indeed, any woman standing up to the patriarchal powers of the church risked a terrible death. I know I've been burned at the stake many times. The disenfranchisement of women by the church continues to this day, although it is certainly more subtle than during the Middle Ages. 
I believe that religion and culture are intimately woven tapestry. Exactly. The threads of religious belief pass into the culture and the attitudes of a culture get sewn into the fabrics of its religion. There are in many ways inseparable. So, too, the mystical traditions and alchemical practices born out of a religious insight, which are supposed to be above the earthly issues, are invariable affected by the cultural assumptions as well. Thus, one can see the threads of male dominance in every fabric of mystical and alchemical systems throughout the world. As a document purporting to impart an alchemical system, the manuscript is unique in that its methods are steeped in feminine mysteries. Perhaps this is because it shares roots with the Isis cults of Egypt. Some of the alchemical presuppositions of the manuscript are in alignment with major alchemical schools or lineages of the world. However, some of its views differ quite radically from other alchemical systems. For example, the manuscripts hold the relationship between sexual partners in high regard. This intimate act is used to activate certain alchemies within the initiates, but the emotional relationship between the male and the female is viewed as a sacred foundation of these alchemies. 100%. 100%. You need to be, in, a, in my opinion, you need to be in an intimate relationship with your best friend, with the person that you trust and love and who loves you in return. 100%. For another, the female is, is seen as holding within her nature certain alchemical keys for transformation. These keys cannot be forced, but are accessed only when there is safety and love in a relationship. This approach makes the manuscript unique within other alchemical systems. Believing as I do in the power of synergy, I feel that those undertaking this personal experiments with the Magdalene material would do well to become aware of the other major alchemical schools accessible at this time. In other words, place the manuscript in context with other internally based alchemical systems. For this reason, I have presented a brief survey of three other major alchemical streams in regards to the sexual practices of internal alchemy. I present this in the hopes that it will provide in interested readers with a broader context of understanding the implications of the manuscript and to better utilize the practices to their benefit. So we're going to end that. We'll just call this uh, part A. 8a um before we get in next week we'll get into the tantric yoga and then from there we'll move into the next section uh, in part eight um which i believe goes into taoism and goes into uh buddhism which um i know that a lot of people are probably going to question that because we know that the dalai lama is very much a part of the controllers group but i just want to say with things like buddhism and hinduism which buddhism does come from hinduism it's basically a philosophy more than anything. There's not as much dogma as there is in maybe the Western perception of spirituality where you have Christianity and other, even, even with Eastern religions like Islam, there's more um, of a structure of a dogma of rules to follow where in um, Hinduism and Buddhism, it's more of a philosophy. It's more of the independent practitioner taking control of their spiritual life through guidelines and a teacher. And so that's the big difference. And so even though the Dalai Lama might be corrupt himself, I still see a lot of value within uh, Buddhism and Hinduism. Just as the church is corrupt, I find great value in the teachings of Yahshua and Magdalene, true teachings of Yahshua and Magdalene. So we do need to make sure we're always um, separating the system from the teaching because they're two different things. You know, you can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater because there is value if you remove the system from the actual teaching, if that makes sense. All right, you guys, I hope you're having a wonderful day and I will talk to you soon. Bye.